Psalm 24, reading from verse 7, page 555. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, and the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. So tonight's second reading is from Matthew chapter 2, and in the Pew Bibles that's on page 966, and we're going to read a selection of verses from Matthew chapter 2, so starting at verse 1. So Matthew 2 verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, Report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years and older, in accordance with the time he had learnt from the Magi. And verse 22. But when Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Amen. So our Advent, our pre-Christmas, perhaps more accurately, series of, of evening sermons begins this evening looking for the King. Matthew chapter 2. I came across a, a news item last week. Anybody see anything interesting about that? It's from a, um, a Salvation Army shop in Peterborough. That, that's right. That's right. Somebody has stolen the baby. And as one of my students said, if there's silver lining in it, at least they knew who the main person was. <laughs> so that's something. And it's right, isn't it? Without Christ, we've just got nothing there. Shall we pray together? Father, as we think of what it means this evening to look for you, to look for your Son, Jesus, we pray that your Spirit might illumine us so that we see Jesus Christ and through him we are led to you. Guide us in our thinking, in our speaking, in our reflections, in our questions. Lead us so that we might think your thoughts after you 
and live the lives that you call us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if we've got the title, Looking for Jesus, or Looking for the King, in Matthew chapter 2, who's looking for Jesus? Now I'm looking for four answers. Anybody give me one? The Magi, the wise men, the kings, whichever you want to use. The term Magi comes from the Greek, it just means great, the great ones. And we're not exactly sure who they were, but we'll come back to that in a minute. The Magi, anybody else? Herod. Good. Two. Anybody else? This, this... Shepherds. Were they in chapter two? Okay. Anybody else? Looking for Jesus? Two other groups at least. The priests and religious leaders were looking for Jesus as well, weren't they? You know, Herod comes to them and he said, you know, what's, what's this all about? And they didn't know they were looking for a baby. They didn't know they were looking for Jesus, but they were looking. One more. One more group. And when they got excellent full marks to this, the uh, young people on this side. <laughs> and that's why that's there, sort of roughly. When the soldiers came looking for Jesus, he wasn't there. So we could have four groups of people, at least possibly five, looking for Jesus. But I want to focus on two. I want to focus on Herod, and I want to focus on the Magi or the wise men. What I'd like to do this evening is to throw out a number of ideas to you. Um, some of them will be very familiar to you. Some will be familiar, but perhaps with a different twist. Some will have a level of depth that I just can't begin to go into tonight. So I want to just leave them with you. And one idea in particular, I think, well, I can't promise that every time I preach from now on I'm going to mention this idea, but it might come pretty close. First thing I want to, really there are two big sections. And the first thing to look at is looking with the right attitude. And you can see what, I, what I'm going to talk about here. The two different attitudes between the Magi and Herod. Why were the Magi looking for the king? It tells us in the text. So it tells us twice in the text. Verse 2 and verse 11. They were looking to worship. Coming looking for Jesus. But again, I say looking for Jesus, but not, I'm getting a little bit of feedback here, and if, if it's, uh, is that better? Is that okay? Is it clear enough? It's, it's just me. Okay, that's fine. Um, they were looking to worship. They, they say quite clearly that they've come to worship the one who's been born king of the Jews. Who were these men? Well, we don't really know. Anybody who has looked at uh, Ben-Hur, no doubt it'll get a run out again this Christmas. The opening scenes of Ben-Hur, no, not ringing any bells with anybody. Well, the very opening scenes start with, with a, cloud, a cloudless sky, stars, and you can just see one star slowly tracking from right to left. And then the camera pulls back and you see the classic images of the three. Of course, we don't know that there were three, but classically, the three wise men. And the filmmaker has made them one an Egyptian, one an Arab, and one from India, Hindu. And if you read Lou Wallace's original story, there's a conversation between them. They all know something about something, and something special is going to happen somewhere, but they're not quite sure. But they know they're looking for somebody special. They were probably priests of one of the ancient uh, religions at the time, and I'll come back to that in a minute rather than saying any more now. Enough to say they were looking to worship. Scripture is very, very clear to us. If we are looking for God, 
in order to worship him, we will find him. There is just no question about it. It's that attitude that is crucially important. Now, I'm not thinking here only of those who are not Christians, but I'm also thinking of those who are Christians. Because it can be dreadfully easy to fall into a relationship with God that falls short of worship. And I wonder if in some strands of Christianity, especially the Christianity that, that we see too often on um, uh, internet channels or sky channels, too often coming out of certain parts of the United States and certain parts of West Africa. It's a, what's sometimes called a therapeutic deism. That'll make you sound very impressive if you say that. Therapeutic deism, looking for God to make my life better. Simple as that. Looking for God to make li my life better. Scripture's promise is if we look for God to worship Him, we will find Him. No matter how much or how little we know. But of course, these men were not only open to worship, they were open to truth. They were aware that what they knew was not all that was to be known. And again, I'm going to come, come back to that in a minute. I wonder, am I, am I speaking perhaps as much, maybe more to Christians here than, than to those who are not Christians? Because it can be easy if God is the one who makes life better for me, to come to Him and say, Lord, I want you to guide me so long as it's in that direction. I want you to hear my prayer, and really, Lord, my prayer is actually pretty specific. And the truth of what God is saying to us is, no, not that direction, that direction. The truth is that it's not what you're asking for that you really want, but what's better for you is this. And to be open to the truth of what God is saying to us, wherever we are, again, we find that promise that He will answer our prayer, that He will lead us in the way that He wants us to go. So they were looking to worship. They were open to God. They were open to the truth. I have a quotation here from C.S. Lewis. Many of you will, will know this, this quotation. And it's, I read it for your encouragement, because Lewis is saying here that on the surface, he wasn't open to truth, and yet underneath, something deep was going on. It's about his, his conversion. You must picture me alone in that room in Magdalen College in uh, Oxford, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted the truth that God was God, and knelt and prayed perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing, the divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet, but who can duly adore that love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking and struggling, resentful and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance of escape. Wow. And Lewis reminds us there that even if we're not actively seeking for truth, truth has this way of impinging upon us of forcing itself upon us in love so that it breaks down the barriers that we set up. But I wonder. They were looking to worship, open to truth and open to God. What about Herod then? Here's Herod looking suitably evil. I don't know if you know anything about Herod. Herod was probably around 70 at this time. So particularly at that, at that time, 2,000 years ago, 70 was a ripe old age. Most people didn't live 
uh, beyond 50, perhaps. So if you're at 70, you're well on in years. And even in the years up to this, his rule had not been steady. His father was from Idumea, the old Edom. His father had become a Jew, and Herod had been brought up a Jew. So he was really only a first-generation a natural-born Jew, if I can put it like that. And not surprisingly, many of the other Jews said, we have been with Abraham, sorry, we have been following God since Abraham. Our ancestors left Egypt, and so on and so on. And you're a Johnny come lately. His throne was constantly under threat. Now he's reaching the end of his days, and suddenly he hears, the king of the Jews has been born. No surprise at all that the instability or the instability of his situation made him really afraid. We're told that he was disturbed. And not surprising at all that he was looking to destroy the one who had come. Well, you don't have to put yourself in in Herod's position to, to see that. There are many, many times when we find ourselves in similar positions. The uh, senior executive in a company who sees a young executive coming on and knows that they are far better than he is or she is, and knows that they're going to be a threat, and just knows that their days are numbered. Or the, oh, let's go for a very different one, the prima ballerina in the troupe who sees this young girl coming in and just knows that she's better and knows that it's only a matter of time and a short time before her days are numbered. Or the new fellow or new girl who comes along to school, and they're smarter, they are better at sport, they're more musical, and to make it even worse, they're just so nice. (laughs) It's worse than that. And you know that you could be pushed out because you can see your friends just starting to to drift. Herod, deeply unstable, deeply self-centered. It was all about Herod. It was all about him. It was all about his family. It was all about keeping power. Think of what happened when he sent the religious leaders away to search the Scriptures and come up with an answer, to tell them what what was going on. And they came back and said, yes, the king of the Jews is to be born in Bethlehem. But of course, they had a lot more behind that, didn't they? And again, I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit more later. Who is this one that was to be born? The king of the Jews? Yes, the Messiah, the Deliverer the leader that would overthrow the Romans, the one who would set his people free, the one who would establish the new kingdom, the one who would rule in righteousness. Now, if Herod had been saying, yeah, I see that big picture. Won't that be fantastic for my people? Won't that uh, usher in a new day of wonder and glory and majesty and power and fruitfulness? Won't that be great for my people? Let me worship him. But he couldn't. He could only see the threat to him. And so he wanted to destroy. So what's our attitude as we come to to Jesus? As we look at Jesus, perhaps for the first time, perhaps for the thousandth time, do we look to Jesus in order to worship? Or do we look to Jesus in order to fulfill my selfish unstable desires? Do we look to Jesus to lead me in a way that will benefit the whole of His people and His creation? Well, let's throw it out. Or do we look for Jesus just to make my life better? So, looking with the right attitude. But also we find the things here about looking in the right places. And I've got perhaps five different places to look And I'm tempted now to stop and say, go through the verses and see if you can find the five places that people looked for guidance. 
Four of them, I'm, I'm fairly sure you would get. The fifth one, you probably won't get because it's not in the text. <laughs> the first one was looking at creation. Yep. See, it mentioned in verse 2 and verse 10. Now, we have absolutely no idea what the star was. Was it a, a natural phenomenon? Was it a supernatural phenomenon? We don't know. But we do know that it was a star. So in that sense, it was a part of nature. And of course, that's consonant with the biblical witness, isn't it? The biblical witness going back to the Psalms, where the psalmist talks about the heavens declaring the glory of God. Or you come into the New Testament and you have Paul writing to the Romans. And when Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 1, he talks about certain qualities of God that are made obvious to everyone because we can read them in creation. So let's pause and think about that for a minute. If I'm looking for Jesus, or perhaps if I'm listening to try and hear what God is saying, sorry, I'm a bit, a bit throaty. If I want to hear what God is saying, remember that in creation there are echoes of who God is. Look around you. Look at the natural world and see if God is dropping little hints to you from the natural world. We can see that God has designed it. It's one of the um, stas uh, uh, classical signposts to the existence of God, sometimes called the watchmaker argument. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it. If you're walking along the beach and you look down and there's a watch and you pick up the watch, what do you say about that watch? Well, you can ask a number of things, but one of the things you could well ask is who made it? Because it is so intricate, so organized in itself that you can't imagine it just happening. You can't imagine it being the force of the wind and the tides and rocks bouncing off each other and so on to make that watch. It's just dead obvious, isn't it? Well, the whole universe is so much more complex than my watch. Just look at your hand for a minute. Look at the complexity of that hand. Look at the things that it can do. It can write, it can touch ever so gently or not so gently. As we look at creation, we hear little whispers of God. And I wonder if today we should be looking at creation and hearing more than little whispers of God. As we look at creation and see gross pollution, as we look at creation and see the natural uh, reserves of the world being used up and wasted, as we look at creation and see problems looming with the rising temperature, whether it's man-made or not, let's leave that to one side, but it's happening and we have a certain amount of control over it. Look at creation and listen for what God is saying. It's not rocket science. These men looked at creation. They saw a star, and it led them to the king. Here's the second one. Now, this is the one that isn't in the text. So I'm flying a wee bit by the seat of my pants here. And this is the one that you're allowed to say, Drew, you're talking nonsense about. But let me throw it out to you anyway, because it seems to be implicit in the text. As these uh, magi are following the star. They didn't follow the star right to Bethlehem and see it stand still over a stable and walk in. At some point along their journey, they may well have said to some young lad down by the Jordan, hey, fella, where's the best place to, to uh, go across this river? And he would have said, down that way, sir. And as they come into Jerusalem, did they naturally know where the palace was? Did the star stop over the palace? No, there's no hint that it did that at all. Hey, what's the best way to the palace? It's that way, left, and then first, right. 
or after they had been into the palace and found out where they were going? Did they automatically know the road to Bethlehem as they were leaving Jerusalem, winding through the narrow streets of Jerusalem out to the east? Did they? Surely they must have asked ordinary questions and found their way. I wonder is that simply a wee reminder implicit in the text that in the ordinariness of life we can find direction towards finding Jesus. Theologically, it's called divine providence. We believe that God orders the ordinary things of life, not just the big things and the, the fortunes of empires and governments, but God orders the ordinariness of your everyday life and mine. He makes things happen. He allows things to happen. And if our eyes are open and our ears are open, in the ordinariness of life, we can hear God speaking. We can sense His direction. I'm not talking about anything particularly mystical. Let's go back a, a couple of little bits to that new kid at school. Just an ordinary thing in life. Surely as a Christian, you know when you meet that ordinary thing in life, that ordinary situation, that God is saying to you, go ahead, make her welcome. Go ahead, make him, make him feel at home. Is that just too ordinary? I, I don't think so. Here's one that's often uh, left out. Oh, I'll, not, I'll, not, I'll ask the question first because the answers are on the slide. In chapter 22, tell me at least four emotions that we find in chapter 22. Anybody? Give me any of them. Oh, sorry, chapter 2. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry. Chapter 2, sorry. Any emotions in there? Fear. Fear. Disturbed. Disturbed. Anger, and I heard one over here, joy. There's at least four emotions there. Now, the interesting thing about those four emotions is that they were opportunities to hear God speaking. If you look at the, at the very end, for example, when Joseph is afraid, God speaks to him and sends him to Nazareth. His fear was the starting point. It was his fear that allowed him to hear God. The joy of the Magi allowed them to worship with extra fervor. On the other hand, Herod's disturbed feelings sent him in entirely the wrong direction, and his anger just made it even worse. Listen to your emotions. Because we are not just cerebral people, we are not just thinkers, we are emotional people. And why should God not talk to us through our emotions? Again, is it not natural to think that God moves our emotions as well as our minds? Here's the, the thing that I've, I've mentioned to you before, and I want to, to suggest it to you again. It's called the pastoral cycle. It's a little four-step process. It's not actually a circle. It's a spiral because you keep going round it and round it. You feel an emotion. The first thing you ask is, what is this emotion? Now, sometimes that's not, not terribly easy. Sometimes it can be hard to distinguish between things like fear and anger. But you stop and think, what am I feeling? Then you ask, why am I feeling this? And then you say, Lord, what are you saying to me in this situation? And then, Lord, what do you want me to do now? What am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? What is God saying? What should I do? Come to, to Joseph towards the end, and you can see that, that process. Sorry, I need my, my big print version. Uh, in verse 22, this is Joseph. When Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place with his father Herod, one, he was afraid to go there. So Joseph feels afraid. 
Why did he feel afraid? Because he had heard that Archelaus was there, and he knew there was great danger. Then he listened for God speaking, and what do we read? He was warned in a dream. He heard God speaking. And then what did he do? He took action. Just a lovely little neat way of approaching life. What's happening? Why is it happening? What's God saying? What should I do? It's not always as neat as that. Still four questions that are worth asking because those questions allow us to hear God. And if we go around that circle, we take action, and it all goes wrong, well, you just start again. What happened there, Lord? Why did it happen? What are you saying to me now? What do I do? It's tucked away in many, many places in Scripture. And if you think that's bad, here's one that's even worse. <laughs> we tend not to think of it very much these days. But Scripture's full of God speaking to people through dreams. You're four examples in, in the text here. I'm really only looking at 13 and 19 at the minute. I'll come to 22, 12 and 22 later. Dreams are not to be set aside easily. Now, I, I do want to be careful here. Uh, when I was uh, preparing, I found, and you'll find this, this thrilling, to dream of a badger is a sign of good luck after you've been through difficult times. What about that? <laughs> yes, what do we call that technically? Nonsense. Yes, absolute <laughs> nonsense. Absolute nonsense. I'm not thinking of that sort of looking at dreams. I'm really not. But there are patterns in dreams. It's well known that there are patterns in dreams. Certain types of dreams speak of anxiety or fear. Do you ever have a dream that your teeth are falling out? Classic dream. Classic anxiety dream. Do you ever have a dream where you feel you're falling? Classic anxiety dream. What about a dream where you're being chased? Yeah. <laughs> or a dream where you're chasing something but never quite managing to make it? All classics. And there, there, there are various others as well. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying you read things into every little detail of every dream. All that I'm saying is that disturbed dreams, disturbing dreams, generally speak to something disturbing that's going on and are worth talking to somebody about. Somebody wise. Somebody really wise. You ever think of listening to strange voices and hearing the voice of God? Now, what voices am I talking about here? Well, that, that symbol is the symbol of the Zoroastrian religion. And most of the ancient commentators, I'm thinking of back in the early years of the church, reckon that the Magi were followers of Zoroaster. Is another name. Anybody drive a Mazda? Nobody drive a Mazda? One or, one or two Mazda drivers? Yes, you know your car is named after an ancient god. Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Wisdom. That's these people. There was something in their religion that gave them an echo of truth. Something in there. It's a a classic missionary understanding. Ooh, sorry, I didn't realize the time. I'll, I'll finish in, in just a minute. It's a classic understanding of Christian mission, always has been, to look at the religions of the people that you're coming to and to look for what are called preparations for the gospel. What does that religion say that gives us something to hold on to? For example, these, this particular religion and contemporary Islam says the same thing. There is one God. And we want to say, yes, that's right. There is one God. And then engage in a conversation from there on. Strange voices. Voices that we might not expect 
to tell us anything wise. But voices that God can use. Hmm. And here's the last one. No surprises. There's a, a group of religious leaders surrounding Vladimir Putin. I, rather, I thought of that uh, thinking of the uh, Herod in the middle surrounded by, by the uh, wise men. If only they had really listened to the Bible. Again, a couple of different folk listening to the Bible here. There are the religious leaders. Herod was quite right to go to them and say, what has the Old Testament, the Bible, got to say about this? Absolutely right, did exactly the right thing. Don't be afraid to go to the leaders <clears throat> of this congregation and say, explain the Bible to me. Well, maybe not quite just that, but explain, would you help me understand this wee bit? Would you help me see this a, a bit more? Don't be afraid to do that. That's what they get paid for. Just a pity, isn't it? They just saw that one text, and Herod was overthrown by his selfishness. If he had opened himself to the breadth of Scripture, I wonder what happened to the religious leaders. We really don't know. Now, they get a bad press, don't they? And most of them did turn against Jesus eventually, but not all of them. In Acts, for example, we are told that quite a number of, uh, of priests came to uh, faith, but they had that instinct that they were right. Look at Scripture, because Scripture is the place where we hear the authentic voice of God. Scripture is the place where we look and we see God most clearly presented to us. All of the others that I've mentioned, they give hints. Of course they do. But here it is in plain type. Who else looked to Scripture for guidance in this text? Anybody? The priests or uh, the religious leaders? At least one other person clearly looked to the Bible for guidance. Great. Absolutely right. Can't you see it as you read chapter 2? Look how often he points to the Old Testament. Look how often he says, this has been written. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. What's Matthew doing here? Matthew is reading the Bible for himself and saying, let me get to grips with what it's saying and bring it into my own life. Let me look at my situation through the lens of Scripture. Can I bring this diagram up again? Having looked at all that had happened in this story, Matthew interprets it through the lens of Scripture. So can I encourage you to do that? You're looking for God's guidance. You're looking for Jesus. You're looking for the King. Make sure you're looking in the right places. Creation will speak of Jesus. God's providential ordering of life will speak of Jesus. There are strange places in which you can hear the voice of Jesus if your ears are open, or see Him if your eyes are open. But primarily in Scripture, wisely interpreted, we hear the voice of Jesus. We see the King. And if we come with the right attitude, Come wanting to leave ourselves in a position of worship before Him. Come not looking for God to do something wonderful for me because I'm worth it, but looking to fall before the King of Kings because He is worth it. Then we find, we worship, we live. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord for all the good things that you do for us. As we look to ourselves, we recognize that you do great things for us. 
but we also recognize that it's not in looking to ourselves or thanking you for the good things that you do for us that is our first attitude to you. Lord, teach us to fall in worship. Teach us to bow before you. Teach us to submit all that we have and all that we are to you. So that not only might we see you in all sorts of places, ah, but Lord, other people might see you reflected in our lives and come to worship you also. So may it be, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, for your presence with us this evening, we thank you. And for the promise of your presence as we go, we bless you. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.